Medical Center. Uh, my name is Tom Sabo. Before I explain myself, I do want to give a shout out to Jody Kelly. Jody, put your hand back there. Jody is responsible for making this space come to life once again in our community, and we're super, super grateful. Uh, the Garage Cultural Center has a sign in book over there if you want to make sure you're getting uh, updates and notices about all our events and there's many many events going on please sign over there there's a bunch of other information as well so again tom sabo i'm a science teacher at montclair high school i'm also the sustainability coordinator for the school district and i'm the director of a small educational nonprofit called center for sustainable systems or css if you want to get on the mailing list for that, you have to sign up over there at the side of the room. The CSS was formed to help start or help uh, support sustainability programming at Montpelier High School. Uh, not limited to, but, but often focused on food systems, which shows here in, the, in one of the panels that we're having. Um, the idea for this series came about when Jody and I met, thanks to Teresa Mary Clausen right here, and she was interested in, in having more community events up here and also connecting with the schools and with students. At the same time, the board of the CSS was thinking that we should have limits of our educational efforts and our engagement efforts to the school. We should reach out to the community a little more. So the timing was perfect, and we came up with this pollinator series. Last week we had our first panel, it was a, a pollinator crisis panel. Uh, this week we have climate change and food security. And on Saturday from 9 to 3 will be the, the Let It Be uh, Arts and Craft Fair. There will be workshops, um, there's going to be vendors, so please put that in your calendar. It's going to be a great event. All right, that's my intro. The structure for the evening here, we have a fantastic panel. If you're putting together a panel on climate change and food security, you'd be hard to do much better. Um, we are going to set it up here. You see that? Really? You want to it up. Expectations you want to raise it up here. Right? <laughs> start with Joseph. He always works. So, um, the structure is going to be uh, each of our panelists are going to have five minutes to introduce themselves and speak a little bit about their experience uh, in this realm. After that, I'll come back around and have, um, based on the intros, a, a targeted question for each of the panelists maybe for the whole panel. That'll get us about halfway there, so please hold the questions, and at that point, we'll take Q&A from the crowd, okay? So, the, the vision of my sequence here is we're gonna start with Joseph Kiefer, uh, where he's gonna talk about food security. And I know, I recognize many faces, I, I know many of you, and many of you are familiar with Joseph's great work. We'll talk about food security over the last few decades of food insecurity uh, in Vermont. And I'll lead us up to the present, and at some point we're going to move forward into this, you know, this world of, of climate change. Um, after that, Josh Buckner, Dr. Josh Buckner from UVM, is going to speak about how Vermont farms are already being impacted by climate change and what's being done about that. After that, author, activist Grace Gershuni is going to talk about organic farming and how that factors in currently and how it can factor in more moving forward. And finally, Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. A longtime organic farmer is going to talk about his experience as a farmer in the States and then, of course, the, the legislative side of things. Okay. Joseph. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jody. Thank you all for turning out tonight. Uh, um, you know, this is like a such a big piece of pie on this topic, a oh, piece of cake that Jody made us. <laughs> You know, I, I tend to look at the topic of food security and think it's something very much taken for granted. You know, most people were, were very lucky and fortunate, and uh, our choices are going to uh, the co-op or uh, another store to get our food. But if you're if you're not as lucky, uh, you basically uh, are dealing with food insecurity, which is really where I'd like to focus. Uh, you know, the, and those who experience food insecurity are a growing number of people in our community. I'm on the board of the Montpelier Food Pantry through Just Basics nonprofit, and over the last three years, we've seen a tripling in demand 
uh, at the food pantry. So we're seeing more families, more elders, and more homeless people coming in who have limit, little or no cooking supplies, uh, basically a can opener, and so, so that's part of our experience. Uh, I guess I'd like to start my story back in the, when I received my phone call in 1982 from the Community Action Council Outreach Director Joseph Gainza, who asked if I'd be part of a community, ta community task force on hunger. I, to be honest, was shocked because I didn't see it, didn't know it, didn't think we had a problem on hunger in Vermont in 82. I said, sure, and they just experienced a 650% increase in demand. And we thought, wow, that's significant. I wonder what caused that. And we started looking around at other community action around the state, and we found out there were similar numbers of uh, dramatic increases in demand. Well, of course, it was Reaganomics at the time, cut back in federal programs, trickle-down economics, as you all recall, and what trickles down is very little. So we started organizing the food bank and invited Governor Kunin to start a task force on hunger, and we had six hearings around the state. I say that you know when you start looking at food insecurity, you realize it's not just uh, the physical demands on food; it's the emotional, spiritual demands on food that drains the body. And uh, these hearings were painful. They were painful because we. One of the quotes out of the hearings uh, was a woman who said she was a Central Vermont nutrition aide. When I was growing up in Vermont, it was a different world. I guess we were poor, but we always had food because we kept animals and grew a garden and put up food for the winter. But now a lot of low-income families can't do that. They don't have land or the skills or the time or equipment to do it. So, you know, I look at food insecurity, it's defined as the lack of access to enough food to fully meet basic needs at, the, at all times due to a lack of financial resources. So here in Vermont, you know, we have uh, high rents, high fuel costs, if you are lower income, I'm also on the board of Highgate Housing in Barrie. And it's a, it's a tenant community board. So you pay 30% of your income, whatever that income is. So it's adjusted, it's a HUD um, supported initiative. And uh, I, I, after five years now, and I've learned way too much about housing issues, um, but I've come to see that it's actually a poverty trap. It's really hard to get out. It's easy to get in, there's a roof, there's, there's you know, you can get food, you can get by, but if you make too much money with an off and out, you know, with a job, you can jeopardize your ability to live there. So we're, we're experiencing these kind of initiatives around the state. Clearly, as we look at, you know, I've come to see and define the, you know, the challenge of hunger, especially in the early years, was that it was invisible. It was quiet, it was silent, you didn't see it. It took you a while to learn to identify and be kind of uh, acclimatized to the issues of what hunger meant in our community. Well, now we know a lot more. We know the serious impacts on children, educational, nutritional, health, behavior. We know it of families, working families. We know it of elders. So we're seeing the serious consequence. You know, here we are in the great state of Vermont. We all live in our various bubbles, I believe. I think one of our bubbles is we're all food secure, and that we probably are. But there's a whole slew of us walking the streets every day who aren't. And they're getting by, you know, they may look fine, they may be dressed okay, but they're struggling. So it's a, it's a really hard world out there for many of our neighbors and our community members. And uh, I think, you know, in a way, uh, I'll conclude my first five minutes, but I think we're stuck. I think we're stuck. I think we've gotten duped into a system where we think that hunger relief is an answer to the problem. And it isn't an answer to the problem. It maintains the problem, it manages the problem, but it's not a solution. And as we move into a kind of a greater awareness, this conversation has to go on all around the state, every, you know, on a regular basis, you know, and I know that the Sustainable Montpelier is working in this conversation, there's a lot, because this is gonna be our future. How do we feed ourselves with an extreme weather warp climate changes? And, and how do we kind of get back to some of the things that we know how to do, communication, food, sharing, resources. So I'll pause on that with, with this piece, which I was gonna start with, but it was by Dwight Eisenhower, our 34th president. Every gun that is made, every warship launch, every rocket fired signifies in a final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed. Those who are cold and are not clothed. The world in arms is not spending money alone. 
It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of his children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the threatening cloud of war, it is humanity hanging on a cross of iron. <laughs> All right, good evening. Um, so, <clears throat> my name is Joshua Faulkner, and I work for University of Vermont, and I have a position um, that's called the um, Farming and Climate Change Program Coordinator, and it was created as a result of Tropical Storm Irene. And um, when, and a big part of what I do, I, I do a few things. I, I teach a little on campus. I, I do applied research, but I do a lot of um, work both one-on-one -on -one with farmers and then also um, traditional extension and outreach with farmer groups and talking about climate change, talking about um, resilience and, <clears throat> and, and not only how it impacts the farm but how it impacts um, our, our surrounding environment. And so I mentioned Irene because when I talk to farmers that is um, I think in a farmer's consciousness when you when you bring up the the phrase climate change, a lot of people, have, farmers immediately go back to that, that single event and that kind of frames the conversation for where we move afterward. And I, I think that's a really good place to start when we talk about the effects of climate change on agriculture. And, and the key ones um, that we see in the data are that we've seen in the Northeast as a whole, we've seen annual precipitation increase by about four inches um, over the past century. Now, it's very different when you drill down into the climate district specific data and you look at Vermont and you kind of, you piece that away from the Northeast. And in the Northeast Kingdom, for example, we've seen increases of nine inches on an annual basis in the last 30 years. So four inches over a hundred years, that's multiple generations on a farm. That's something that can be adapted to. Nine inches over 30 years, that's within one generation often. And, and that's a challenge. Um, the other thing we see and is, is borne out in the data is an increase, not just in precipitation, but in the patterns of precipitation. And I'm sure many of you, if you've been in Vermont for, for any time, um, you can anecdotally attest to that, that we see more of the, the extreme events. That's kind of um, what you see headline events in the Northeast are these extreme events. And we've seen an increase of 70 some percent uh, extreme events over the past 50 years or so where the rest of the country has seen an, has seen an increase but more on the order of 30 um, percent, some, some uh, no Pacific Northwest 12 percent. Um, so this is our headline story in Vermont and regardless of a farmer's politics, when you go on to a farm, I work with dairy, I work with veg, I work with beef, livestock, all farms of, of, of all stripes. Um, and regardless of where they stand on climate change, and if they even want to talk about climate change, they'll talk about those extreme events and how much more difficult it is to manage their soils and manage their, their production system, whatever it may be, um, in the face of, the, of, those, of those events. And then I think the other really important piece, there's, there's many effects of climate change, but the other really important piece to talk about here that, that rises in, to the top is is that um, the, the unpredictability of these conditions, is that um, we may have drought and we may have one of the, you know, we may have one of the wettest Mays on record followed by potentially one of the driest Julys on record, that we can have swings on either ends of, end of the spectrum um, in the single year, and that's really difficult to manage for if you're a producer and you're, you're used to operating within certain boundaries. Um, that you need to, you know, it's not just going to be a wet year, it's not just going to be a dry year, you need to be ready for everything that the climate throws at you. And so that, it, I, I think, above and beyond possibly um, extreme precipitation and, and more rainfall, it's that, it's, that, it's that wildly unpredictable variability um, in conditions. Um, the other thing, uh, so doing a lot of work with farms on resilience um, and trying to not just Build farms that so there's we can talk maybe later a little bit about resistance versus resilience but there is a, is a difference and we focus a lot on resilience and that's the ability of a farm to to take a climate shock um, and bounce back um, you know it, it is not it is not the condition where the farm is not impacted at all but it, it has some some it gives a little bit but then it's able to bounce back and that's resilience and that's I think where we want to be with our with our farm systems. 
The other thing we're starting to see more and more of now is, is we've worked on resilience and adaptation with agriculture for quite a while. And now the conversations, and I think everyone's probably aware of these if you're seeing um, current news stories, is how can agriculture also be part of the solution to climate change? And so I think we may talk about that a little bit tonight and um, <clears throat> how farms can start to sequester carbon and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, a, a kind of my work in a nutshell. Um, and we're at five minutes. Good. Okay. So I'll pass it on to Grace. Perfect segue. <laughs> Perfect segue. Yes. Thank you. Because uh, my my stick is definitely farming as a solution uh, to climate change. And I, I just since a lot of people here don't know me, uh, I will uh, mention a little bit about what my background is. I I uh, really got most of my education by working. For NOFA, uh, I hope I don't have to spell out what that means. <laughs> NOFA uh, is great, great show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, starting in the mid '70s, organizing a farmers market that's still going in, in uh, Newport. But uh, what I eventually, you know, went back to school, got my master's in extension education at UVM, and but NOFA was my real education, and um, and I've since then gone on to teach and write and organize and all of that sort of thing. Um, and I uh, started teaching at the Institute for Social Ecology back in 1986, thanks to an invitation by this guy at the other end who was uh, needed a co-teacher for the bioregional agriculture course. So um, I've taught in various other college settings and most recently um, at Green Mountain College on the, the Master's in Sustainable Food Systems online program, which sadly is now defunct, although it's moved on to uh, Prescott College in Arizona, where I also taught in social ecology. And my, a lot of people are I'm notorious uh, for the, my role in creating the National Organic Program. So, in the 90s, I was recruited by USDA to come write, help write the, write the rules for the law that was passed in 1990. And uh, I have a long background in developing organic certification for, for NOFA, particularly. And so um, that was such a, a mind-bending experience. I was on the staff for five years and uh, I had to, the only way that I could really explain everything that I, that, that was in my mind in the whole process was to write a memoir. So uh, I took me 15 years, but I wrote the, my life story interspersed with a lot of policy stuff about organic and what it really means and all of that sort of stuff. And uh, it's called Organic Revolutionary. Um, a memoir of the movement for real food, planetary healing, and human liberation. Not very ambitious. Um, <laughs> and it's actually now, be, it, was, it ended up being self-published. It's now coming out in a third edition from Black Rose Books in Montreal uh, soon. It's overdue. So that's the, the, the one minute, I hope, <laughs> summary of my background. Lately, um, and in my old age, I'm moving out of trying to scrape together a living, um, mostly with, uh, most recently I've just been doing a lot of organic inspection work and traveling a lot, but um, I have gotten very involved uh, with the steering committee of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. Um, and have brought a whole bunch of literature and urge everybody to sign up uh, for the, the listserv. Anybody can be a member and you get access to all the literature that's out there, uh, which is on the, on, oh, hi, Jael. There's another one of our, our steering committee members here. Uh, so that involves really spreading the word 
about <coughs> the potential for agriculture, and not just agriculture, but any form of land management to mitigate climate change impacts, but also to begin to reverse the impacts of climate change. And it's not just about carbon, it's also about the water cycle and the extreme hydrological events that Josh is talking about really are a function of the, the destruction of ecosystems that has been going on since the Industrial Revolution, really, but accelerating uh, rapidly. So um, through building healthy soils, and there's a set of soil health principles that anybody can begin to follow, um, and the importance of regulating the, the water cycle as well as the carbon storage. And it's all part of the same system. It's all mediated by the, the biology and the, the miracle of photosynthesis that can turn sunlight and carbon dioxide from the air into food. Really, that's where all of our food comes from. Um, so, um, organic agriculture really is about soil to begin with, and uh, the, the dispersal of biocides in the environment, the dispersal of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, um, which results in the off-gassing of nitrous oxide, which is 310 times as potent a, car a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide um, are all part and parcel of what organic agriculture addresses. And at this point, now that we can actually count the number of organic farms and their productivity, we have more information about the fact that, yeah, if you compare the carbon footprint and the greenhouse impact of organic systems with conventional or other systems, they always come out better, whether it's on water quality, biodiversity, and biodiversity is key to all of this, um, and as well as carbon sequestration, as well as uh, nutrition and nutrient density. Um, and by the way, there is also, there are, there's also information coming out that the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually causes crops, they, it may help them grow faster, but in the process of growing faster, their nutritional content is lower. And that's been... Fluctuating. Yes. So I'm going to make one last, I have one last point to make here. So the idea of biodiversity it also extends to social systems. And this is very much uh, part and parcel of the Institute for Social Ecology, which I've also remained part of ever since 1986. And, um, and the the real thing about the solution to food insecurity is really what uh, we would call food sovereignty, which is local control of, over food producing resources, more people on the land having more control <coughs> over, their, uh, over their food supply. And um, the thing that I'm most uh, interested in pursuing in my, in my elder years here, is really uh, setting up systems to enable sharing of the land with people who have not had access to land, refugees, and we're going to have some refugees and climate refugees, and uh, as well as political refugees, and it's all connected, of course, um, in that we really need to, to make, make way and to accommodate and to welcome um, the people who are going to be leaving wherever they are now and get them settled on the land. And that's going to be as much a solution for, to our food security 
issues as anything else that we could do. I'll stop there. Um, all right, so uh, David Zuckerman, I'm uh, co-owner of Full Moon Farm with my spouse, Rachel, uh, and I'm also the lieutenant governor, and um, given the dress of the crowd, I'm glad I chose to go with a farmer outfit, not a suit, um, <laughs> which uh, is a daily conundrum for me. Um, and, um, but, uh, but to bring it back to this, this, the more serious topic at hand, I first want to recognize, um, as I think more and more people are trying to do, that uh, this meeting, as we talk about land and soil and our climate, um, is being held on unceded territory of the Abnaki people. And um, we have to continue to remind ourselves and awaken ourselves to that reality. And actually, as, we were, as, we were, as I was listening to some of the statistics coming our way, I was really reflecting in my own mind about how um, what we are learning through the scientific world of dissection, um, these people have known for thousands of years and uh, lived on our land in a way that uh, would not have caused these kinds of impacts and lived the um, sustainable life that um, I think many of us would aspire to live and a few, uh, including myself, do not, you know, few achieve, I do not achieve it myself. Um, but it's also not a perfect history either. Um, there were differences of opinion across different native people, indigenous peoples, and, and, and strife and challenge and other issues as well. But from a climate and land and soil management perspective, um, they didn't manage the land, they lived with it. Um, my, our farm uh, raises about 15 to 20 acres of vegetables each year, about 750 to 1200 meat birds each year, pasture moved twice a day across our cover crops on our vegetable soils. I uh, raised 20 to 30 hogs to slaughter and sell about 80 piglets. Um, and uh, we currently have about 75,000 pounds of food in storage. Uh, this is the time of year when I can shout out big numbers like that. Um, but to put that in perspective, that's enough food to feed all the people in the county I live in one half pound of food for one day. And we're a bigger farm, we're one of the top 5% vegetable diversified farms in the state. So we want to talk about food security, not only on the individual basis of health and um, access to food and, of any kind, much less healthy food. That is a huge issue we're all trying to struggle with and deal with. Um, but realistically, even those of us that are more comfortable and buy local food and buy organic food and everything else, uh, we're still a far, far, far cry from creating a system that is truly locally sustainable. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, with respect to climate uh, crisis, um, you know, last year uh, it rained in the spring and then it stopped raining where I live. And we ended the season about 35,000 pounds of food short. This year, April and you know, May and into June was uh, wet and cold every day, you all know that. We lost thousands of pounds of food from our cucurbits that all dampened off. Luckily for us, the rest of the season was almost as perfect as it could get with some rain almost every week. Um, but uh, some of those rains are definitely more intense. I mean, there's no doubt that you don't get the all day gentle rain. That is what the soil and the plants can work with. You're getting these downpours and obviously the Halloween storm is you know, just another reminder of that, but it's not the only one. And the other thing I would say is wind. Uh, we are getting much, much stronger winds. And that isn't just blowing down power lines, uh, but it's blowing row cover off crops, plastic off greenhouses, trees onto buildings and greenhouses. It's blowing over crops. And the thing that I think it's doing more that people don't realize is it's blowing in uh, pests and diseases earlier in the season that as an organic producer, we used to get our crops healthy and big enough that as certain pests arrived, the crops were big enough to thwart that impact. And um, it's getting harder and harder to thwart some of those, and some diseases don't have organic remedies, as sweet midge being one that's uh, changing the landscape uh, for broccoli in any case. I had a lot more to say, I've got about 30 seconds left, that's why I'm using this rude device. But um, I remember in the state house hearing from some farmers a few years back, uh, some dairy farmers, they were saying, hey, you know, if it's warmer and our season's longer, we'll get a fourth cut of hay. Right? They were seeing it as an opportunity. And um, and before everyone, and I saw a few heads, you know, shake no or kind of scoff, 
Um, farmers are trying to make a living. And being able to maybe produce more and squeak out uh, a living that's slightly more um, respectable by today's standards from an economic perspective, I think it's important to recognize that that's seen as a potential benefit. Now, I would hazard to ask most of those folks with the first cut that was a disaster from the wetness, uh, which is usually one of your you know, most voluminous cuts, uh, to the fall uh, grain corn that they didn't harvest because it's that's in the lowest, flattest, best soils that got flooded with the, with the uh, Halloween rain. Um, maybe they're rethinking some of that, and I would guess our, our doctor, doctor over there would know some of that better than I. Um, but uh, it's, it's um, I guess I'll wrap by just um, saying this is a huge and complex problem, and I, I think that one of the challenges we have to face, and I'm going to go back to Joseph Kiefer's comments earlier about Reaganomics, we've been living under trickle-down economics since the 80s. It was not just under Reagan, it's been under every presidential administration and most state administrations that rich people need to have lower and lower taxes, and somehow that's going to create an economy that's going to build it up for all of us, and I would say that's all been completely the opposite. Um, however, those of us that are more comfortable have to recognize, even if we're in the middle area of comfort, that the number of things that we think we need versus what we really need and want um, is something we really have to discuss because without a better system of, of uh, economic reward for everyone and being valued in their society, whether it's farmers, janitors, uh, folks who are picking up garbage on the street, um, as long as we have this kind of economic disparity and people are working 50 and 60 hours a week, still having to go to the food shelf to get food, not even having the time in their day to come to a meeting like tonight to talk about these issues because they're simply struggling to hand off the keys to their spouse for the one car they've got so their spouse can work second or third shift. While they're struggling to put a Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, birthday, holiday gift out, one gift for their kid, and pay their electric bill, they, 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 they don't have the time to be uh, having this conversation, uh, much less being able to make the decision to buy recycled toilet paper, much less the, the rev car and put solar panels on their home. And if those of us who are comfortable enough to be able to consider being a little bit less comfortable to make sure we have a just economic society, that's going to be part of what leads us to adjust Ecological society. Thank you. So, uh, a couple of quick questions, and then one larger question that will probably segue us into a you know larger Q and A. Um, Josh, you, you mentioned the the extreme events which everyone is, is dealing with right now. A lot of that's around weather and, and water. Um, David mentioned pests blowing in more than you'd seen in the years before. And last week we had a pollinator crisis panel where there were researchers here talking about the, you know, the extinction of bumblebees, um, which are, are, are such important pollinators. How much are you seeing that in like, the farms around Vermont in your work? How much of the problem are, are insects, whether it's, it's change of range with pests or the loss of native pollinators? Sure. I'm sorry. I'm not an entomologist. I'll just preface this with that. Um, so the, I can cite one example that is, I think, a, a good example. And before I, before I do that, let me say that there's a tremendous amount of debate in the scientific community right now about um, whether climate change causes these pests or if climate change just creates conditions that are more hospitable to the pests and other vectors that are driving those pests upward. Into, into New England. Um, but the one, I think, good shining example, at least in the, in the veg and, and small fruit world, is spotted wing drosophila. Um, and there's some good work from Cornell. And this is a fruit fly, if you're not familiar with it, that, um, uh, that attacks um, soft fruits like blueberries and raspberries. And it just, um, I, I don't know, David, do you raise small fruits? And I don't, but I have friends that do, and it's talked about a lot on the veg and berry discussion. It's nasty. I mean, just the fruit looks good, but then when you when you touch the fruit, it's mush. It's just it, you just can't be it can't be salvaged. Um, 
And Cornell estimates that it will do $8 million worth of damage per year just to the New York State fruit industry. Um, and we don't have a study like that in Vermont, but these small fruits are really important for some of our diversified farms or smaller farms. And so this is one that we're really concerned about. The apple community is also very concerned about some other diseases and talking about wind as a vector fire blight is driven by wind and so that's a concern as we see how winds so those are those are two examples that I would I would cite. Great thank you. Um, okay super quick question. David, which is harder, farming or politics? <laughs> uh, it's not as quick as you think, but um, I will say the two I actually they each have helped me with the other in that um, in both instances um, success is usually not achieved suddenly. It takes lots of investment of time and energy. Um, a lot of times you can work for an extended period of time on something uh, and not know that you're going to get the result in the end. Um, and that often um, you have to plan for a lot of options as you're going through the course of the season, whichever definition of season you want to use, and that a sudden event can radically alter the outcome. Um, we could say that with uh, the work many people did on um, different measures around what gun ownership or control or prevention, violence prevention measures, many people have worked on for decades and one threat, and we had a massive change in Vermont with that law. Um, it can go the other way, where you work for 14 years and pass a law on GMO labeling, and you know, I, two years later in Washington with $120 million of of lobbying, it could be ripped up and thrown away. So um, your work can be rewarded and destroyed at the drop of a hat, and in both of them, you need the patience and fortitude to just keep going. Mm -hmm. Good I got a lot of questions. I imagine you have some questions as well. So I'm gonna try to um, pick one and maybe merge a couple here. I'm going to cut right to it. <laughs> I prepped you all a little bit about this. We want to jump right to this. When you, you think about climate change, you think about food security, access has, has, has been the issue in uh, the developed world, certainly in the United States and Vermont. Right? Availability um, may also become a concern for extreme weather events, etc. When you look at it from a, a climate justice, like a just transition angle, David, you, you brought in another important point that, that farmers need to make a living too, so, so the price is important. One other set of data out there that you see conflicting reports about is, is the crop yield gap. Can we grow enough food organically to feed our population? There was a study out last month, October, that got a lot of press in, in Nature, very prestigious, the most prestigious journal, was on PBS News if it is no So <laughs> talking about a study in the UK, and that if the UK were to convert 100% to, to organic agriculture, it would increase greenhouse gas emissions 21%, because they have to convert more land, and they'd have to rely a lot on imports. Now that study pivots, and we spoke a little bit about this, that study pivots on this yield gap. So to the whole panel, Take it as you will. This is the last question before we'll turn to the crowd. Can organic ag, and I think when we're talking organic ag now, we're going to be talking about regenerative ag, right? Which, which one of its, some of the Pretty techniques. Pretty much the same thing. Okay, okay. <laughs> and that maybe will, will be discussed a little more later, right? We, we need to stop emitting as much, but we also need to draw it down. Can regenerative organic agriculture grow enough food for our population? We can start with Vermont. David, we can then go nationally, we can go globally. Who would like to take the first crack? Mindful that we're gonna, we're gonna share this answer and then we're gonna bring the audience into it. Well, I would say the answer is yes, but it would also require uh, all of us as consumers to uh, be mindful of our consumption. And I mean that, um, partly in volume, because about 30% of the food that ends up on a plate in this country ends up in the trash, uh, but also in what types of food and how much of them you consume. I produce meats, 
I'm not a vegan, um, <laughs> but I also uh, grew up eating meat, you know, two or almost three times a day, and um, I think that's excessive relative to a balanced ecological footprint. So I think it's a combination of production and consumption. Uh, and then I would just say, add to that that um, the longer we farm organically, the more we rebuild the soil's capacity to produce in the kinds of yields that, that completely compete with uh, conventional uh, large input agriculture. Okay, well, I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to be short because, <laughs> Sorry. I, no, it's okay, because I, I've put, I've spent a lot of time on this very question and I certainly saw that article and that study from Nature and have been keyed into many rebuttals to that story. And the, the basic thing is that certainly in terms of greenhouse gases, they did not, uh, they did not assess any of the things such as the, the carbon footprint of all of the agrochemicals that are used in other kinds of agriculture. They did, they did not assess the uh, greenhouse gas, uh, you know, mitigation of not dispersing synthetic nitrates in the environment uh, and a few other things like that. So essentially, and then they were positing the, the, uh, the expanded uh, area of land needed to grow the same amount of food based on a bunch of trials on experiment stations that compare uh, what, you know, what it might be considered uh, organic by neglect um, <laughs> sorts of plots compared with the supercharged, chemicalized, high input sorts of plots. So essentially, this was a piece of propaganda that was put out there, and it really doesn't have that much validity to it. Um, so that's the first thing. But the other, the piece about how, how we can feed the world, well, we shouldn't try to feed the world. The world should be allowed to feed itself from its own land, from, from the people having the ability to feed themselves and their own communities from their own land. Uh, certainly not, <clears throat> there's no purity around this, but essentially the idea that, uh, that we need huge you know, tracts of land to feed the, the teeming populations in the cities is, is the current state of affairs. It's true, um, but what we need to do is to radically uh, restructure our economic, political, and food systems as a consequence. And that's really um, what the just transition demands. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, good answer. I, I'll just add that from where I sit, I think that the one thing we have to remember is that our land grant university system, our in industry, agricultural stakeholders have not put the level of investment and in research into organic systems that we have into conventional systems. And there's a lot of room for improvement for new tools, better tools harnessing the use of technology, and some people fall on both sides of the fence on that one, but I think there's, there's the, that it's right for research and to improve the efficiency of these systems and maintain the values that, that we feel strongly about in organic agriculture. Great question. <clears throat> Back in 2007, 08, 09, another governor's task force on hunger, so I, I, I witnessed these. Uh, one of the recommendations was for town food plants. And sometimes, you know, the, the danger of these task forces is that nothing really follows through. Great ideas, great press, everyone reads about it, gets concerned about the problem, and then kind of goes to sleep. Uh, Farm to Plate, which I work on the a food access group, uh, just this year created a nice little town planning uh, food access booklet suggesting that, in fact, if we start thinking differently about what we do within our own town, 
and start looking at our agricultural lands and preserving our agricultural lands, that we could start really planning out how do we think about food production in a town-wide level. How do we use our schools for food processing? How do we use different areas that we already have for storage? So there's, you know, I think it's gonna take imagination, creativity, uh, just to go back a little on history, back to 1917, Montpelier was called uh, uh, a city of gardens. Mm -hmm. So for the war effort, we geared up and militarized and everybody was growing food, kids of all ages. So I think, you know, at this point, you know, this is a conversation we have all the time within the farm to plate community. Can we, um, you know, A, can we learn how to feed ourselves again? Can we equip all of our kids from preschool on to elders with this, you know, and, and part of it being maybe some kind of a youth service core that everyone's growing food everywhere? Can we think differently where we live so we're seeing foodscapes mm -hmm. everywhere? And uh, I was showing Ann Watson a minute ago, so way back in 1988, oh, yeah. sixth graders created a food policy for the city of Montpelier. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we need to be thinking so radically different about this transition. We can't wait, it has to be, you know, but that's the kind of question that prompts this kind of thinking and said, well, we, you know, we don't do that. We haven't done that. We have to start thinking like that and acting like that and engaging everybody in the community to think differently about how we live and where we live. Nice. So, so I think it's doable. Uh, you know, but I think it's going to it's going to really mean we've got to put ourselves. We have to be bold. We have to be imaginative, and we have to really gear up to, to say how do we do it? What's what's our five year plan? And then after five years, okay, how do we do? Let's get going for the next five years. Now we just offer a quote. <laughs> I just just uh, read a, a report on a recent Democratic candidates debate in Iowa, which quoted our Senator Bernie, saying, if we are really serious about fighting climate change, all of agriculture should be organic. All right, a couple, uh, couple ground rules for the questions. Uh, we don't have, you know, we have about 35 minutes or so, uh, and we have a, a great audience here, so pick your question carefully. Uh, I will call on you. Please um, indicate uh, which panelists or uh, the, if, whether the questions go into the whole panel. Okay. And once again, we're going to go for the three before me policy of once you ask your question um, and that other question pops right in your head, wait for three more people to ask a question before you go for it. Yeah, good policies in your mind. Yeah, you like that? That's a good one. All right. Yes. Okay. Whole panel. When I was here 10 years ago, uh, Post Peak Oil Solutions was talking about a plan to get the bigger farmers who were aging to be having small little plots of land for younger farmers. Did anything ever happen with that? I did. Never heard of it. I mean, I think there's been some land share ideas out there, but I don't know how they've, if they've been implemented. There has been some yeah. um, through the Vermont Land Trust in particular yeah. Yeah. Um, getting tenant farmers or I, I don't, anyway, I, I have some friends in Barnard, mm -hmm. Fable Farm in particular, um, and they've also created a collective. Um, so there, um, and in the Northeast Kingdom, John Ramsey has also been helping folks find land and, and have transitions. It might not be, um, anyway. There, there's examples. There, yeah. there may be examples, but I would say probably unfortunately it's far more the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. been far more consolidation, particularly in the dairy industry, mm -hmm. um, where it's fewer people owning larger pieces of land um, rather than more uh, smaller mm -hmm. agricultural operations. Awesome. Dan? All right, this is both, I guess, picking up on what Joseph had to say and heading to David because it becomes politics. Um, <laughs> Yes, it's obvious that there has been a lot of ideas about what we ought to do. Um, I remember going, following you with a camera one time when you were trying to feed uh, people in the housing project you worked with, and there was a whole cultural resistance to trying turkey burritos. I mean, it was a, it, 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 it was a uh, point where it said, okay, how do we, then, and this is where it goes to David, 
how do we begin to get the public sector support for the kind of education, organization, and we'll call it subsidy that's necessary so that some of these kind of models of what can happen become both encouraged and visible because what we have is sort of this bifurcation of uh, you know, people like you who are the farmers, okay, but they're sort of, you know, everybody else is sort of like, well, I have a garden, I grow a couple of tomatoes maybe or not, but uh, there's not this sense that we all own the challenge of uh, the food system and is there anything that the state can do to help in uh, encouraging, uh, you know, a different addressing of that problem? I think that was you, David. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think there's a few things. Um, we actually already are doing a lot more than most states. That's not to say we've done enough. But if you look at farm to plate, farm to school, um, you know, there are, I, I think one of the things we have to be very careful of, um, you obviously had an experience with Joseph in a housing situation that had economic struggles. I think it's really important that we not jump to conclusions based on class with respect to people's interest in food supplies and healthy food. Um, when I look at the Old North End in Burlington, there are gardens showing up in green strips, gardens on old lots that have been um, abandoned, and um, they're, they're incredible community centers in, in moments um, of, of all kinds of neighbors coming together uh, to tend them to uh, some of them are just free food for who needs food, um, but the community works on that food together on that production. So um, I think the first piece is to, to evaluate our own perceptions and misperceptions, and we have to do it constantly. We'll never break down all of the stereotypes that we each have uh, towards others. But, um, but I think it's, it's example by policy, like farm to plate, farm to school. Um, I, you know, I was thinking when, you, when Joseph was putting out these, these plans and these visions and so forth, you know, the state could supply free seed, right, to, uh, to anybody who has the land to grow food. Now that then gets into a whole other issue around who has access to land and who doesn't, and that's a whole other wealth question and discussion, but probably not for me to continue on too long. Well, I, I would just add that, you know, one of the things that um, we are working with, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's that, the climate um, caucus from the legislature that's been going around having hearings, and they have been hearing from us in the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, and there's also um, a, a, a payment for ecosystem services working group that we've been involved with, and that involves essentially doing what they what they now do in Europe, uh, which is they uh, provide payments, subsidies to farmers for the ecosystem services that they provide, such as clean water, beautiful landscape, um, and in fact, transitioning to organic. And that's one of the reasons why the land in organic production in Europe is in the double digits, and here it's still 1%. And you could add carbon sequestration, you could add habitat oh, yeah. diversity, there's a lot of... All of, all of the above, yeah. I'll just take a quick shot as, as far as addressing a, a lack of housing to a lack of food and food access, I see it as a failure of government. It's policy. It's intentional policy. I think we've created a permanent, we have a systemic issue around poverty, and we've created the conditions that maintain poverty in this country. So it's gotta be policy and intentional policy that changes systems. So to your question, Dan, you know, it was in the 90s that we, a bunch of us spent a lot of time in the state house and we created Rozo's Law, named after Rosemary McLaughlin. And she was a legislator who helped with the farm to school. It became one of the first farm to school laws in the country with money that the state legislator put out so we could have grants for planning and grants for implementation. We now have 80% of our schools in Vermont who have farm to school programs. So we're kind of leading the country, which is you know a way of trying to give every child a, a shot at learning where food comes from and how to grow it and how to cook with it and how to eat it. So I think if we, you know, uh, just down the street here, if we mobilize and we're strategic on whatever efforts it was, 
we could be working policy in that legislature. We happen to know the lieutenant governor happens to be right around here. We could be knocking on his door. And, but I mean, I think there's things we can do that we haven't been doing and that could influence and help to shape policy for the future. I wonder who was chair of Ag back then. <laughs> okay, Liam. Um, so I think uh, looming ahead is 2020, and uh, there's a lot of things that could be addressed. Obviously, because there is an upcoming presidential election to address the elephant in the room, and if there is one thing that could be addressed purely for 2020 even though there shouldn't be, because there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. In my opinion, what stands out is either like bringing down the cost of uh, fossil fuels and uh, uh, really closing the gap on the real estate industry and making sure that it has the lower income uh, range interests in mind, or it would be um, just kind of making sure that uh, these farms that can save species that are going close to extinction from doing so, investing twice as much into Vermont farms, which, uh, like, I'm gonna go with you, David Zuckerman, just because you talk to a lot of people and you have influence in this area. I, more than anybody here I can think of. Um, which which one of those two that stand out in my mind, do you think, would it be? Just as a fun yeah. hypothesis question. Uh, well, I, I think um, the reality is we, uh, to, I'm gonna not quite answer your question, but uh, it is not gonna be a silver bullet approach. I think there's, um, a lot of critically important things and sometimes we lose sight of the fact that our policymakers can actually walk, chew gum, and rub their bellies all at the same time. Uh, we normally see through the media that uh, this one thing is the only thing that we're talking about and you know we can talk about something that's pretty prevalent in the national news uh, with today's announcement. Um, when in reality uh, we need to actually pressure the media to, to talk about all the other things that are also happening regularly in, in the political arenas that it isn't all focused on one topic. But I would actually say, as I started my opening with, um, I think that the, the, one of the fastest ways to mitigate our climate crisis um, is actually through universal health care and livable wages. Um, and uh, that, that will fundamentally shift the uh, that sort of time-space continuum for people to be able to see a surrounding world other than just trying to struggle to survive. And if people are struggling to survive, um, it, it will continue to be. A, what's happening next week is a secondary issue to what's happening in the next hour for a lot of people. Thank you. Jael? I have two questions. I already have both of them in my mind. So <laughs> 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 once. Um, my first question is about getting more local food in the schools. In districts where um, they have the residents have lower income, um, because with the farm to school project, I, a lot of schools are able to raise the money, um, you know, by having fundraisers with parents to get that um, buy those <coughs> local foods. And um, for districts where parents don't have a lot of money, they can't raise that money. And I worked in the kitchen in the school in my district. Um, and it was really hard as an organic farmer to feed kids commodity food that comes in a can that's also leaching toxins. And I know Dexter Randall introduced a bill a long time ago to try and get schools to have more local foods. And I'm wondering if we can, I don't know, if the state could look at that again or what we can do. I mean, it would be income for farmers <coughs> It would be better for our children, especially if it's organic. It'd be better for our climate. Um, I know Anthony Polina said that there was some commerce issues, interstate commerce issues with that legislation. But um, my second question is um, <clears throat> how can we get more farmers into the climate movement? And this is probably for you, Josh. Um, 
Um, I'm a farmer. I'm also a climate advocate, justice, climate justice um, advocate. So I think it's important that we get farmers into this movement. And I don't know if you're hearing more farmers talk about it, like the conventional dairy farmers talking about climate change and if they're noticing it and how can we bring them out to talk about this. Want me to go? Yeah. Um, sure. So I've seen things, I've been in this position for six and a half, seven, almost seven years now. And in that seven years, I've, I've really seen things change. The, the first couple of years that um, one had to use quite a bit of tact when doing climate change outreach and education and technical assistance and talk about all crazy weather and you know it's not the way it used to be and um, but now even at our biggest in-state um, uh, you know conventional agricultural meetings and conferences climate change is on the agenda people are talking not, not everyone um, not you know not everyone but it is very much part of that common conversation amongst conventional growers um, and I do think that things like uh, the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group and the Farmer Coalitions um, joining forces and supporting and then being engaged in that conversation has really um, kind of brought that terminology and that conversation about climate um, and, and just it's proliferated throughout the farming community because of those conversations, partly because of uh, there may be opportunity for another revenue source, but partly because you know, the coalitions are behind and engaged in this conversation. So. Local foods and schools? Well, I mean, I, I think fundamentally so much of this comes down to money. And uh, just fun facts that are not so fun. Um, Vermont is uh, the poorest New England state. We are the one receiving state from Washington, all five other New England states, plus New York and Jersey. Uh, send money to DC. Um, we, I'm a, an advocate of progressive taxation and that wealthier people could pay more. If wealthier people paid more, we still would not have enough money for our mental health crisis, our uh, unjust criminal or prison system that right now there's a 200 person meeting in Burlington that I'm not at. Uh, and that I think you all know the topic. Um, there's a housing shortage crisis uh, we're weatherizing 3,000 homes a year, 2,000 homes instead of 10,000 homes a year. Um, and we have six, you know, 100 fires to put out with one fire hose. Um, and uh, so it comes down to money. And um, that's not necessarily what everyone wants to hear. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions on school food, subsidy policy, buying of food. Most people maybe don't know this. I think most people on this panel probably do that the majority of the food in our schools that's subsidized from the federal government uh, is a food program through the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. um, it primarily comes out of that same you know, 1930s and 40s wow. war food effort that was all put into the Department of Defense and it still remains there. So some of that's federal policy shift, uh, which goes back to this gentleman's topic of the 2020 election and who's president. But even then, you know, if that's not on their radar, that ain't gonna change. We've had a lot of good presidents and that hasn't changed because of the scale of issues to deal with. I'm working with the Montpelier Tree Board to create food forests in Montpelier. And my question goes to soil because, you know, in town, we don't have the, it's not easy anywhere to, to be organic and regenerative. I mean, it takes space and time and knowledge and resources, but in town we have tiny properties where people don't really get that a, a mowed lawn is not maybe the best way to grow <laughs> food. So um, this may be just a pondering question, just to throw it out into the world that in this room, but our tree board is looking for help with how to improve the soil inside Montpelier so that our neighborhood streets can become food forests. Mm -hmm. Where we have, and we've done this on St. Paul Street, we planted 23 trees of which 18 were nuts or fruit or berries. 
and getting the, the people on the street to agree to share the produce with whoever walks down the street. So we did that. But the soil's not great, and we need to improve the soil. So if we're going to spread this to other streets in Montpelier, how can we go about, how can we capture the imagination of our, of our residents to bring regenerative soil practices to each household? I guess is really what I'm thinking. I have one word. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and all and you know, we also happen to have, you know, we're we're in the final stages supposedly of implementing Act 148, which is means that food scraps cannot go into the landfills from anywhere. And uh, I've also been working uh, with Kat Buxton on the uh, farms, farm composting task force, trying to find farmers who will be able to accept food scraps. And of course, here in Montpelier, we've got the wonderful um, Carl Hammer, but there's also an issue on the policy level, which maybe we can talk about, which is the problem that, um, you know, some of the most effective um, farm-based uh, composting operations are being threatened with having to get expensive permits from A&R because of, because they, <laughs> yes, <laughs> because they, they let it's the chickens forage out the topic. food scraps and, and, you know, so there's this whole mess that has to do with the division of labor between an agency of ag and and, and A and R and you know, water quality restrictions that you know we need, certainly need to be concerned about the water quality, but not at the expense of not being able to recycle and having having the farms be put out of business basically right. in the composting business. So. To, to the extent that people can get energized to support the local <coughs> compost production and closing the loop with the food scraps and getting that nutrient, all those nutrients that people have been throwing out back on the land and in particular to improve the soil in the urban foodscape. Well, there you go. Like that. That is, in my opinion, the way it goes. That's a big word, compost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the young lady sitting next to you would want to ponder with you, because we were chatting earlier about this exact thing, minus the food forest, but. You mean that distinguished woman? That oh, distinguished I mean, woman. Oh, my gosh. And, and isn't it possible that you and I have been pondering? We have. Oh, we've oh. been pondering together. Oh, I didn't know you were it's pondering okay. together. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I should have guessed. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We haven't said it out loud oh, to a lot of people. Okay. Well, I, I have, uh, since, since I've been pointed out, I uh, might as well, if, if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, so. It's there. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I mean, my head just goes to solutions. What can we do? What are the things? What are our options? Um, so, uh, just thinking about Montpelier, I want to know how many acres would it take to feed Montpelier? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a reasonable question. I, I'm just What's like population? dipping my toes in this. What's that? Population? Uh, so, 7,500. Um, I would love to know, like, how many, I mean, we're surrounded by farms, how many acres does Montpelier need to be surrounded by to, to sustainably feed ourselves? Um, thinking out loud, um, I was just talking today with uh, Tom about the possibility of, like, what if we had a competition in Montpelier for uh, the best mm, food pollinator, not lawn, food pollinator yard. Uh, you know, 500 buck uh, like award in the middle of July. It's a panel of judges going to come to your house, check out your food pollinator yard. That's not a lawn. I don't know. I'm just I'm brainstorming here. Uh, another possibility: what if uh, um, what if we had citywide 
trash, recycling, and compost. There are a lot of people here who don't have access to composting in their backyards. So what are they going to do? They got to hire service. What if the city of Montpelier um, had collection points or trucks that could do curbside? I don't. I don't know. There's. I have a lot of questions about whether that's and feasible, we but talked about vermiculture before. Yeah. yeah. Well, and but then, uh, what is the prospect of? And I'd be this. So I'm going to follow this into a question. Um, what if we were to take that compost because it would be substantial? And there's one hypothesis is that there's not sufficient facilities in Central Vermont to handle that volume of compost. I don't know. I'd be interested in that. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, if there's not, what is the, what are you, what's your opinion on uh, possibly pyrolyzing that um, organic material? And where does biochar potentially fit into that picture? Is this a good thing? Does it complicate things? Is it, in your view, arguably carbon negative from a long cycle carbon perspective? Sorry, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> well, there's a lot of there, there's been quite a vibrant discussion on the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition listserv, which I recommend that you get on. <laughs> really, you know, it, it's a really good discussion list, and a few people who are avid proponents of biochar who are always bringing up the facts and figures behind all of these things from heating plants, central heating district heating using pyrolysis as the heat source um, to you know all of the carbon <coughs> drawdown benefits etc and you know I'm, there's still a lot of nuance in that question uh, to be sure um, but there certainly could be more small scale compost facilities more very regional localized facilities that fall under the radar of the ANR rules so that they wouldn't have to go through the permitting process and could really supply much more localized communities. So that's really sort of the, the way that we've been trying to orient. Um, more people can compost. And I know that uh, Joseph was also involved in the master composter uh, program and you know the, there could be you know, very small neighborhood composting facilities where people can who can't you know, they just can bring their food scraps and somebody you know would have a little mini enterprise dealing with it. Anyway, that's right. we, have, we have ten minutes here. Jody is not kicking us out. There's amazing treats back there. The conversations are going to continue. I know there's folks with biochar interests, which will connect with Anne. Um, Henry, your hands up a while, and then a gentleman right in front of you. Do your questions still exist? Yeah, thanks a bunch. Yeah. You guys are awesome. It's so awesome to see y'all out there rocking it. Um, uh, Dana, I think your talking point about the uh, consumers being kind of responsible for driving organic markets is like from the last decade. I don't think that we you know, just talked about Vermont being this poor state, and it's not consumers' responsibility to be able to afford that premium product to be able to shift the market. And I, I know you know that. Um, I really appreciate what Joseph said about trying to get a lot of people um, involved in food production. I think that you know we've got to. How do we get away from this market-based solution conversation? I mean, Kat Buxton, somebody just mentioned Kat. She said a couple months ago, you know, we we're talking. She's like, we've got to get away from the idea that there's going to be money, mm -hmm. right? And it's true. There's not going to be money. You're not. You don't need to put out 100 fires with one fire hose. We don't like that fire hose, right? How do we figure out how to get a bunch of people involved in food production or generative agriculture in this state without that money incentive? This conversation about like how are we going to curate these ideas and enshrine them on our front yards and like all of that, we've got to get in in involved in like really large scale cooperative agriculture sh stewardship for the commons in ways that our economy has no resemblance of right now. How do we start making the sacrifices needed and building those vehicles to cooperatively reorganize our food economy statewide? If we had food sovereignty in the state of Vermont. That would be leadership on a regional and national scale, not 
laundering our carbon footprint for as many people as were in the neighborhood in Brooklyn I used to live in. You know, that's not, it's not leadership, right? How do we get that food sovereignty, that regenerative agriculture going on on a scale appropriate for our population without that money in I'd love to hear from any or all of Well, I'm, I'll just, you know, I'm a big believer in education, and I think our schools are perfect demonstration sites for any of these initiatives. Henceforth, Farm to School is, has really done well in our state, but it's got a long ways to go, and it's the curriculum side has the long ways to go. But that's a, you know, again, I think uh, impacting our Department of Education, uh, putting pressure there. We already see though, that there's schools who aren't buying local Vermont foods. That is something, there is a statewide farm to school network that does exist that, that is looking at these conversations. But, you know, we just, it's gonna take more imagination. It's gonna take small scale examples to kind of flourish around. I don't think we're coming with a state plan. I think we're gonna have to do small regional examples. Edible Montpelier will be uh, the great example that will lead the way here. <laughs> Food forests, compost systems, uh, you know. I would add, you know, um, in agreement, you know, big government's not going to solve this problem, right? Um, but local organizing is. And uh, some people have the time or the energy or the fortitude to be organizers. I'll continue to go back to the fact that if someone's struggling and working 60 hours a week yeah. to meet their basic needs, it's, it's hard to be an organizer if you're in that situation, and it's hard to have time to be organized by others if you're in that situation. So I, I think it's, um, it's a beautiful thing to have the imagination and foresight of thinking about a society that is not structured the way we are structured, but I think it's admittedly, and I love you, but I think it's a bit utopic to think we're going to get there suddenly. Um, unless there is just this massive transformation, which we may be in right now. I mean, we are in, a, in an interesting, very disruptive time, and in a disruptive time, I think there is great opportunity. Um, but it's gonna take organizing. So I'm gonna use that as a quick uh, moment to say, if everyone sign up for my <laughs> newsletter, I'm gonna pass this around. Um, it doesn't have to just be my newsletter. Um, I actually share a lot of information from a lot of other organizations through this newsletter and could even do things in certain communities if certain leaders in certain communities wanted to maybe abscond with my list and use it to help organize in their town for the right reasons. Um, I would potentially do something like that, say, in certain towns. Or, city, or cities, maybe, with, with mayors that are visionary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I believe in the grassroots uh, movement, uh, but I don't necessarily want to be dismissive of the mega agricultural um, industry that uh, we live with in, in this country. So the question of the panel is, um, to your knowledge, what is the leading uh, agricultural um, industry that is advocating best practice around climate change challenges? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be <laughs> um, so I, I, there was a fantastic article about just that question, Politico, this week, um, and it was about Farm Bureau organiz American Farm Bureau organizations and similar type um, industry groups coming together and discussing how <clears throat> large-scale ag is going to participate in the climate movement and how their attitude towards that movement has changed significantly over the past several years. Um, and I, I don't think there is an answer yet, but they're starting to talk about that. And, and I do, I, I love organic agriculture, but I think in, in Vermont, we have to engage these, this type of agriculture, conventional agriculture. They, they farm 80,000 acres of cropland. And that's, if we're going to have an impact, we have to engage that acreage. So I think that's a really important question. And I would add, you know, the Farm Bureau um, has almost as many members in Tennessee and some of the southern states as our whole state population. But, um, but I was at a lieutenant governor meeting last, this spring, and 70% of Nebraska practically was underwater. 
Yeah. Yeah. And when the states, the, the quote, breadbasket states like Nebraska, and basically anywhere along the, the Ohio, Missouri, and Mississippi rivers continue to flood the way they are with these you know, extreme rain events, um, the farmers are business people, unfortunately, still working within the US currency model, um, and uh, they're seeing these events have these catastrophic consequences. <coughs> so I think that's why some, some of those discussions are happening. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah, and there is definitely a, a, a fairly large, I mean, they're, they're really beginning to talk about cover crops and uh, things like that in the conventional ag sense. Um, so, you know, and there are people out there like this guy, Gabe Brown, who's a large you know, producer out in North Dakota, uh, and who is uh, kind of the poster boy for regenerative agriculture, talking to convention, his conventional peers about what he's doing. And uh, so that's getting a lot of attention in the press as well. But you know, there's also, and I, I just want to warn about the, the greenwash, um, that there's also been a, a lot of interest in sustainability and uh, you know all of that kind of thing amongst the conventional ag community and you know the usual suspects um, touting their their sustainable footprint or whatever and um, it, it just uh, the model of industrialized agriculture really is not compatible with sustainability just so you can have large scale, and you can have large scale done right. And um, General Mills is converting, I don't know, like 30,000 acres in, uh, in the Dakotas and uh, to regenerative practices and going at about it right. Um, but that's not all, not necessarily the the way that some of these folks who, who are touting, say, GMO crops with herbicide used to burn down the cover crops, that's still killing the soil and still contributing to climate change. So uh, I'll just make that cautionary note. Thank you. I'm folks, it's 8.30, and I do want to respect the, the time limits here and, and our Presenters have a ways to drive in some cases. I want to just make a couple announcements though. Uh, there are things to sign up for. David Zuckerman's newsletter is right there. The CSS, my nonprofit that supports uh, this event here and some, some more yeah, events, hopefully, coming around and the work of Montpelier High School. That sign up is over there. Sign more of that, forget one. Why don't you sign everything? There's some more information, a bunch of information, and some things to sign. I need to sign over there as well. So make the rounds doing that. Of course, there's treats in the back. Uh, Dan Jones from Sustainable Montpelier is, is doing work in this area, is interested in doing work. Mayor Ann Watson is launching a, a prize, a, a campaign where you can win 500 bucks this summer. Yeah. <laughs> I live in Worcester, but you know, I'll, I'll rip up my lawn. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I just want—I want to thank Jody again. Not—not <laughs> not just for tonight in this series. I, I do thank you for that. But making this space available, and and you really are um, pretty much at least tied for the busiest woman I know, and I know a lot of busy women um, people. So thank you. Um, I want to thank our panelists, who are also among the busiest people. This guy right here, oh my god. Thank you very much. And certainly, none of this happens. You know, we think about what can be done, um, you know, as a community. We think of what can be done, these overwhelming issues. And sometimes you step out on a little bit of a limb thinking, okay, well, let's, let's host some panels, let's get a discussion. And in this, this small state, this even smaller community, there's, you know, there's, there's other things to do. 
and there's the darkness at 4.25. And sometimes it's hard getting off your couch, getting away from your wood stove, getting out of your house, and, and all of you did that. So thank you to each of you. Thank you.